might notice there's a big 10 behind me and some balloons on stage. The reason is because we are celebrating 10 years as a church. We are celebrating what God has done over the past 10 years. And as we walked into this transition of, uh, you know, being the church of, of 2030 and, and celebrating 10 years of already being a church, I said, God, what is it that we really need to focus on in 2022? And his answer was very clear. It was, well, you need to focus on helping people build their faith, build their faith. And so I want to talk to you about faith that lasts. That's the learning series we're in right now, faith that lasts. And last week I talked about faith for the next 10 years. And that was a message you need to listen to. I talked about how God has moved over the past 10 years and what it took to get us to where we are today and also what it's going to take to get us into the future. Now, before I get into this message, one more time, I want to ask you if you're online, share this message with somebody. If you're watching after the fact, you're not watching live right now, share this message anyway with somebody because today, I want to start a brand new three-part kind of a mini series within our learning series. And I'm asking this question, do I have enough faith? Look at somebody and say, do I have enough faith? They might answer you back. I don't know. But do I have enough faith? Faith. I want to answer this in three parts, and I'm going to answer it clearly today for you, but I want to answer it from three different perspectives. Do I have enough faith? This came from, this idea of do I have enough faith came from my personal observations of faith over the past 35 years of life and growing up in a Christian church, a church that taught faith, um, and I taught bold faith, like real bold faith, uh, but learning from other perspectives and other denominations, maybe you're, you come from a Baptist denomination, Presbyterian denomination, Methodist denomination, uh, welcome to the uh, non-denominational uh, where we are a little bit crazier, uh, but we're a little bit more direct with the word of God, and we believe strongly in faith. Amen? We believe strongly in faith. I do at least, and apparently Jeff Rice does, and so that's about it, but no, <laughs> we believe in faith. But what I saw growing up, and let me tell you, I want to really hone in on this for a second. Um, I've been grieved over the past couple years at how quickly people have given up on faith in God. Like, I've been grieved. It really, it, it, it stirs my soul. It hurts to see that. But one of the things I recognized over the past few months is I started seeing people from my childhood that I grew up with. And I saw them, in, for, for instance, there was one girl. Um, you know how Instagram will like recommend or social media will recommend, do you know this person? And I saw this person, I thought, I haven't seen her in a long time. And I'd just seen her mom. And so I, I clicked on her profile and her profile, the caption basically read, um, you know, I'm, I'm, spiritual, I'm a spiritual being, um, and the whole idea was like, how do I word this? Without, I don't want to be critical of this, but the whole idea was she was seeking out anything that made her feel spiritual. Does that make sense? And I thought, we grew up in the same church. We grew up around the same people. Um, I know her parents were faith-filled people, and yet here's somebody who's my age, and she is seeking out all these different things, whatever feels good, whether it's sex, it's spiritual. Whether it's money, it's spiritual. Just everything is a spiritual feeling. And the danger in that is when you operate under self-guided spirituality, you'll never actually find an answer. You won't. You'll never come to a conclusion because you'll always go by what you feel. But what wrecked me, though, and I thought about this, why is it that people that I, I've known growing up, why is it they have walked in those patterns? Why are they living those, those lives now? And it's because of this phrase that came up in the 90s church and in the early 2000s church, and it kind of corrupted people, and it hurt people. And it was this phrase right here. When you didn't get a prayer answered, when someone you were believing for healing for died, uh, when you didn't get the job, when the marriage fell through, this phrase came up time and time again. You don't have enough faith. Anybody ever been told that before? I have. It hurts to hear. You don't have enough faith. Now, I want to be clear with you. And first and foremost, what I want to do is I want to apologize on behalf of any Christian, any pastor, any leader in your life who spoke that over you. You don't have enough faith. And they use that intentionally to make you feel like the reason why God didn't answer a prayer or didn't answer it the way you wanted is because you didn't have enough faith. If that hurt you, I want to apologize on their behalf and I want to repent on their behalf. Because what I 
recognized now as a pastor, as someone who has to deal with people on a regular basis, is that the phrase, you don't have enough faith, is a reduction, it's a reductionary response to basically saying, I don't know the answer. And so what elite Christians will do is they'll just say, well, you just don't have enough faith. Because it's easy for me to do that, right? If I just say you don't have enough faith, I can walk away and the burden's on you. And next thing you know, you're just like, oh, okay, well, what do I do? Ah, go to a small group. They'll figure it out for you. Like, no, 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 no. The reality is sometimes people would say that because they didn't want to feel the responsibility of what you were feeling. And so it's easier to say you just don't have enough faith. Now, I can already tell, I feel the religious spirit in here and online already. I know somebody out there right now is real mad. But I want to clarify from the word of God, from the experience of Jesus himself, why this is not true. So first what I want to do is I want to go to Matthew chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, pull them out to Matthew chapter 17. And while you're finding that, I'm going to give you a breakdown of the story I'm going to read. Um, I'm only going to read one verse for you today. But in Matthew chapter 17, there is the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, that's not a word we use at parties. Hey, let's transfigure each other. We don't do that, okay? Uh, what transfiguration means is that Jesus went up on a mountain with three of his disciples to fast and pray. While he was up there, he was transfigured. His figure literally changed from human to his godlike self. He glowed in the dark, y'all, almost as bad, as bad as I do. Like He really glowed. And his God side was revealed to his disciples. Not only that, but Moses and Elijah show up. Two guys who were very committed to the Lord our God. Man, they showed up and they, they start having a conversation with Jesus. They're hanging out. They're like, hey, Jesus, we ain't seen you in a while. He's like, I know I've been down here for 30 something years, y'all. It's been a long time. And they're just hanging out, having a conversation. And, and, and the disciples that are there, they're freaking out. They're like, this is Jesus. You really are God? Oh my gosh, look at you. You look so good. And so while this is happening on the Mount of Transfiguration, while Jesus is showing his God side, at the base of the mountain, his other disciples, and, and not just the 12, by the way, Jesus had hundreds of disciples. He didn't just have 12 disciples. Those were his closest disciples. But there were other disciples at the base of the mountain, and there was a father who brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples, and he said, I want you to cast this devil out of my child because he throws himself into the fire. He hurts himself constantly. He has seizures. He throws himself down on the ground and starts having seizures. And I believe there's a demon. And the disciples could not cast it out. And they're just, they're just, Rondai, Shondai, and tie my bow tie as much as they can. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, nothing's happening. The, the demon's just like, I ain't coming out. What you gonna do? They're getting freaked out. They don't know what to do. And so as Jesus comes down off the mountain, he sees this father, and this father runs to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, you gotta help me. I need you to cast this devil out of my son. He keeps hurting himself. And we don't know how old the son is, but I'm assuming this has been happening for several years by this point. So Jesus talks to the father. And actually, I'm going to touch on this subject at stretch night, which you need to be here for, because I'm going to go deeper into this story in particular. But Jesus casts the devil out. That's the short version of the story. Now, the problem with this is the disciples don't feel good about themselves. They just got wrecked by a demon. This is not like a Hollywood movie either, okay, like where they're battling demons. No, like this is legit, demon-possessed kid. The disciples just got embarrassed in front of everybody. They lost their elite status of Christianity in that moment. And so when everybody leaves, they're with Jesus privately, and they said, Jesus, can you explain something to us? Look, because you said that we have authority to cast out demons in your name. We tried to use your name, and nothing happened. Can you explain that to us? And Jesus makes a statement in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. This is what I want you to look at. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible. Somebody say nothing. <laughs> nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I want to read this in a different translation. This is the New King James translation. It says, Jesus said to them, he responded to them. He didn't say in the, in the King James, because you have so little faith. He said, because of your unbelief. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I want to do a little bit of teaching before I do preaching today. I'm in a teaching mood. I look like a professor today. I look really good. Thank you, Holly. 
Um, but I want to teach you something about these translations of the Bible. If you don't know this, the Bible was not written in English. Some people keep asking me, why do you keep repeating that? Because I think it's time for Americans to understand that Jesus was not a Western culture Jesus. I think it's time for us to understand Jesus was not American. Jesus, I want to be very delicate about what I say. Jesus cares more about his kingdom than he does the United States of America. Amen. Smiling. So when Jesus is speaking, he's speaking from an Eastern perspective, overseas, in the Middle East, in Israel, in Jerusalem, uh, over Iran, Iraq, that area. They, they live in a totally different culture, and it's foreign to us as Westerners. And so we get offended when they do something that's different or when we teach the Bible their way. We get offended by that because that doesn't feel like the American gospel. There's no such thing as an American gospel. America wasn't around when the Bible was written. Okay, There was no president. There was no Congress. None of that. That's a history-building thing. But America was founded on Christian principles, but it was also founded by sinful men. I'm off on a tangent, never mind. Anyway, <laughs> so Matthew chapter 17, two different translations, and one says, Jesus says, you have little faith. One says, you have unbelief. What is the difference? Well, there really is no difference because when you go to the Greek, which Jesus spoke in Aramaic, it was translated into the Greek, and eventually it was translated into the English, these books of the Bible. But the Greek word that they translated what Jesus said into is the Greek word apistia, or apostia, excuse me, apostia. And the word apostia has two direct meanings. It means either the weakness of faith or the littleness of faith the weakness of faith, or the littleness of faith. Matthew 17 is where people get this response of, you don't have enough faith. When bad things are happening, you don't have enough faith. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to be critical, and I'm not trying to amuse you with this statement, but I know people who claim they had a lot of faith, and in the past two years they died. I know people who had a lot of faith and said, I'm not getting COVID, I'm not getting this, I'm not getting that, and they got it anyway, okay? So I'm trying to clear up some theology here for you because if we are not careful, we will start wearing a burden on our shoulders that says, I just don't have enough faith, I just don't have enough faith, I just don't have enough faith. What Jesus said in the Aramaic was not, you don't have enough faith. He said, you have a weakness of faith or you have a littleness of faith. Now, for some of us, what we do is we go, but that's not enough faith, right? Here's the good news if you read this. The good news of the gospel of Jesus is that you ha if you just have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. That's what Jesus said. That was his words. That is good news. Instead of focusing on, I don't have enough faith, focus on the fact that Jesus said, if you just got faith as small as a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. If I could latch on to that word, everything in my life would change. It's not that you don't have enough faith, it's just that your faith is, check this out, it's fractured. Your faith is fractured. Your faith might be weak. Your faith might have a little bit of a response to other things. Today I wanna to teach you how to build the God kind of faith. But I want to encourage you first, if you're watching online, if you're here today, listen to the words of your pastor. If I'm not your pastor, I need to be your pastor today. Listen to me. You have enough faith. You have, en you have faith to move mountains. You have enough faith. Look at somebody say, I've got enough faith. You have to believe that in your soul today. I have enough faith. Faith. You have faith. If you really have faith to believe what Jesus said, you can lay hands on the sick and they will be healed. You can cast out devils. That's what Jesus promised his followers. If you have faith, well, do I have enough faith? Yes, you have enough faith. However, your faith might not be the God kind of faith. In 2018, October 2018, I got a bad car wreck. And uh, I know I've shared this story a million times with people who are here, but we have new faces, new people online. And so um, this was a, a cementing, it, it, was a, it was a cornerstone moment for me in my life. It was a cornerstone moment for me as a Christian because I got into a really bad wreck. Um, long story short, I was in a, a year and a half of physical therapy. I was in pain every single day. They had me doped up on medicines, um, muscle relaxers, 
uh, neuroblockers. Um, and here was the thing. I went to chiropractors. I went to neurologists. I went to orthopedists. I went to my physician. None of them can figure out why I was still in pain. None of them. Not at all. They ran tests, scans, anything you can think of, blood work even. They were like, let's figure this out. They could not figure out why I was in such intense pain. They, they, they speculated. But what began to happen, though, is, is as I progressed in this uh, pain, and it got so bad, I, I, I say this jokingly now, but there were some days where I would get up and it, it was only the Holy Spirit on me that I was able to preach because I was so doped up. I would get done preaching, I would get in the car and I'd forget what I had just preached. I'd get home, my wife would be like, Pastor Stephen, she didn't call me Pastor Stephen, but she'd say, Stephen, that's so good. I love that message. I love what you said about this, this, this. I'm going, did I preach that? Are you sure? What church were you at? Because I wasn't there. And I just had checked out mentally because that's what the drugs were doing to my system. And so over that time, though, here's what began to happen. As I went from doctor to doctor, and, and, and stay with me on this, as I went from doctor to doctor, because again, neurologists, they, they had, they, I went from my physician to an orthopedist to a neurologist to a physical therapist to a chiropractor. Every single one of them would speculate what was going on, but none of them knew the root source of the problem. So here was what I did incorrectly is every single time I would come home from one of those doctor's visits, my wife would ask me, how did it go? Here's what I began to do. I began to repeat everything those doctors said. Everything. Well, this doctor thinks it's this, and this doctor thinks it's this, and they think it was this, and they think it was this. What I did, what I did know, but because I was so doped up, which is by you, why you need to be really, really careful about what medicines you're taking, we are for medicine here in this church. I'm just saying, be careful what medicines you take. Is that I was telling my brain there was something wrong and I will continually be in pain until there was a solution. However, because there was no root issue that they could find, my brain just kept sending pain signals, pain signals, pain signals. Well, we think it's this pinched nerve. There was no pinched nerve. Well, what is it now? Well, we, chiropractor, of course. Well, we'll just crack your back a little bit. You'll be fine. Tried that. Didn't work. What I was doing is I kept repeating these things over and over. And in my mind and in my heart, my body is reacting to the words that were being fed to my soul. Do you understand? This is depth right here. This is what you have to understand. Now, I didn't deny the pain. I didn't walk around going, I'm not in pain in Jesus' name. I'm not in pain in Jesus' name. No, I knew I was in pain. I could feel it constantly unless I was drugged up. When, I, when those drugs stopped, man, it kicked in real hard. But because I was feeding my soul these words of confusion and hypothesis and speculation, my body was just responding as if it was still sick. Let me show you what a miracle looks like. I went in faith to God, and I said, God, I'm tired of this. Now, judge me if you will, but it took me about two years to get to this point, okay? I'm a fighter. I will fight through the pain, but after two years, I was doped up. I was done. I said, God, I'm tired of this. And here's what I told God. I said, God, I am praying and believing for, because I was dealing with an insurance company at the same time, I'm believing for this settlement to come in. And I know this is a little selfish, don't judge me. But I said, in Jesus' name, when that final settlement check comes in, I will be healed in Jesus' name. Now look, you can laugh at this, you can think this ain't true, but that last check came in and I woke up the next morning and I have not been in pain since. Not at all, I haven't had to take one drug, I can move my arms like normal, I can move my neck, my head. I can bend over and touch my toes. I don't have to prove that to you, but I can do it. <laughs> what changed? My faith. What changed? My faith. Out of that series of events came a series that we did called Jesus Amazed Faith, which I'll probably preach on in, in uh, next year in 2023 again. But Jesus Amazed Faith, this is where it came from. What you have to know first and foremost today before you leave is I want you to know what faith is. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this in the Amplified. I love the Amplified because it amplifies the understanding. It says faith is the assurance. Somebody say assurance. assurance. 
is the title deed or the confirmation of things hoped for or divinely guaranteed. It is the evidence of things not seen. It's the conviction of your reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. Now, the Greek word for faith here is the word pistis. Pistis is, in this context in the Greek, it is the conviction of the truth of anything. It is a belief. In the Greek, what the writer in Hebrews here says is the conviction of the truth of anything is faith. The first thing you have to know about faith is this. You always have enough faith, but you choose who or what feeds your faith. You always have enough faith, but who or what are you putting your faith into? You have mountain-moving faith. I want you to think about this. I'm going to think about this from the negative perspective of faith. You have enough faith. You have a conviction of your reality. Whether you see things or not, you believe certain things. But if you don't have faith in God, you won't have the God kind of faith. You won't have faith that lasts. You won't have the faith that brings relief from pain. You won't have the faith that brings miracles. In whom or what is your faith receiving assurance? The word pistis here is a conviction of the truth of, get this word, anything. In other words, faith does not mean faith in God. Faith is a substance. It's a spiritual substance, and you get to choose what you attach it to. I'm preaching better than you're talking back to me today. (laughs) Faith is a substance, and everybody has enough faith, but you get to choose what you put your faith in. You get to choose who gives your faith or what gives your faith assurance. Here's how faith works. It's in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In Romans chapter 10, the apostle Paul is writing to the Roman church and he begins to explain to them that if people are going to put their faith in Jesus, you have to choose to put, or you have to choose to preach the word of God. If you don't talk about Jesus, people won't know about Jesus. He's taking it down to the most basic level. Salvation starts with hearing the spoken word of Jesus. But he also makes a statement that is so true that the church has tried to contain as saying that God faith or faith comes by hearing the word of God. That is absolutely false. Faith doesn't come by hearing the word of God because the Greek word for pistis here literally means faith in God comes by hearing the word of God. What Paul is saying is faith of any kind comes by hearing. What your mind and your soul and your spirit hears, that's what you'll put your faith in. What you read constantly on social media, that's what you'll put your faith in. Faith, a conviction of the truth of anything, comes by hearing. The God kind of faith comes by hearing the word of God. But whatever you continue to listen to is what you will put your faith in. All of you who uh, uh, associated yourself with some rallies, some presidential rallies that happened over the past few years, the reason why you believe that candidate more than the word of God is because that's what you listen to. Conspiracy theorists, you know why they believe the conspiracy theories they read about? As Listen to me. (laughs) JFK is not coming back, y'all. He ain't coming back. You can sit in Dallas for as long as you want. He ain't coming back. But why did people, I don't know if y'all saw this. Y'all know what QAnon is? I'm gonna take a second. I'm gonna take a second. I'm gonna talk the truth. I'm not one of those cute pastors who shies away from what's going on. Listen to me. This QAnon stuff was hilarious to me. It was crazy. I hate that it got so out of hand. But there was a conspiracy going around that if people waited in Dallas, JFK was going to make an appearance. J... John F. Kennedy, the dead president who got assassinated, was coming back and he was going to drive through downtown Dallas, the same street he rode on when he got shot. And then President Trump or former President Trump was coming in and he was going to announce that JFK was his vice president, uh, vice presidential candidate. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But pause for a second. There were people who believed that in the depths of their soul. We call that insanity. I call that faith. They really believed that that was going to happen. They camped out. I saw a video of it. 
They were camping out on the, the side streets of Dallas, waiting for JFK to make an appearance. Now, they, they need help, absolutely. They do. But what we call insanity, they call faith. They really believe that. Like Elvis is alive. He is alive. Shh. <laughs> There's this, this identity inside of me. I listened to this long enough, and so this conviction of the truth of anything, the truth of anything means it doesn't even have to be truth. It can just be your truth. It can be self-guided spirituality truth. It can be a different religious truth. It can be any truth. It doesn't have to be the God kind of truth. The God kind of faith comes by hearing the word of God. The God kind of faith comes by hearing the word of God. The God kind of faith comes by hearing the word of God. The God kind of faith, it comes by hearing the word of God. The mountain moving faith that Jesus talked about, it comes by hearing the word of God. Faith in God comes by hearing the word of God. The spoken word about Jesus himself. The word that you will find in your Bible. This is our word of God. This is 66 books of the Bible. God inspired that he gave humanity so we would know his thoughts, his purposes, his beliefs, our way of living, our way of righteousness, his holiness, his mercy, his grace, everything is in the word of God. And if I'm going to believe it, though, I have to hear the word of God. I cannot hear other things. The reason why people are depressed is because they listen to reports on depression. They read uh, all these uh, 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 statistics about depression. The way I know that is because I have friends who suffer with depression. Every time I get on their Instagram account, uh, in their stories, they're sharing posts about how it's okay to have depression. You will believe any truth that you listen to long enough. God designed you to absorb words and put it into your spirit. But to be an effective follower of Jesus, you have to have the God kind of faith. That is the faith that lasts. No other faith will last. That's why the same people who God blessed them, they walked away from their faith in God this year. They didn't have the God kind of faith. They had surface level faith. They didn't have the God kind of faith. And I'm not criticizing them. I, my heart goes out to them because I've been there before. They didn't have the God kind of faith. Why? Because they weren't listening to the word of God. I know what they were listening to because every Sunday they'd come to me with the same complaints and the same stupid situations that they could have solved like that if they would have faith in God. So today what I want to do, I'm going to close out this way. I want to give you the most effective three-step process to start building the God kind of faith. This is going to be a little bit outside of what you might be used to, but I want to give you a three-step process. It's the most effective process to build the God kind of faith. So if you've been saying, I've been struggling with my faith, you haven't been struggling with your faith, you've been struggling with the choice of what you're listening to. So today what I'm going to teach you is I'm going to teach you the God kind of faith, how to build the God kind of faith. This is the most effective process. It's probably going to be a little bit different than what you might have learned at a different church, but I'm going to give you the most effective. This is what I do personally. This is how it works. Step one is this. Don't go to your Bible. Instead, ask God to identify what you need. Let me break it down to a solid level for you. The reason why most Christians lose their faith is because they try to dive right into the Bible and find a scripture for what they want rather than what God wants for them. Did you know you don't need to have faith for a new car? New cars are everywhere. They're everywhere. You can go get one at any moment. You don't need faith for a new car. You need faith for financial stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. You need faith for financial discipline. Yeah. You, did you know you don't need faith to get out of debt? You don't need faith to get out of debt. Right. You don't. You need faith for financial discipline. Yeah. Financial discipline is how you get out of debt. What you need faith for, though, is you need faith for God to give you the grace to have self-control so you stop getting all those credit cards. Yeah. Hello? Right. Did you know you don't need faith for a new job? New jobs are out there all the time. Unemployment rate is crazy. There are people begging for people to work. You don't need faith for a new job. You need faith for self-discipline to stop being late at your current job. I'm being serious here. I had a dude seven, eight years ago. Every three months, he got a new job. And here's why, because he was personable. He had a great attitude when he walked in. And he'd go through the interview, they'd give him the job on the spot, man. He was an awesome guy. Three months later, here's what he'd do. Man, I hate my boss. My boss is so mean to me. He hates me. Always singles me out for stuff. The issue was not that his boss at eight different jobs 
was the problem. He was the problem. But he kept saying, Pastor, will you pray for me so I can get a better job? No. I'll pray that you stop being lazy. I'll pray that you have a work ethic. Hello? You don't need to pray for more money to come in. You need to pray for the discipline to use what you have effectively. So you have to ask God to identify what you need. Just recently, my wife and I had a family situation. Kind of just some animosity built up, stupid situation. So I went to God about it. I had faith. Here's what I said. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus. They're going to repent and ask for our forgiveness. Because we didn't do anything wrong. I'm serious. We did not do the wrong. They did the wrong thing. So I went to God. I got convicted. I said, what do I need to ask for, God? He said, you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to be the one. Mm. I wasn't with that one for a second. But when you study the word of God, here's what the Bible promises. The Holy Spirit will bring the word of God back to your remembrance. And immediately in that moment when I was convicted, I was brought back to Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. I was like, dang it. (laughs) But God identified what I actually needed. What I wanted was different. But what I needed in that moment. So you need to first, before you go to the Bible, ask God, what do I need? When God answers you, it will most likely be something you don't want to hear. Because 99 times out of 100, when you ask God, what do I need? He's going to point out an issue in you before he points out an issue in anybody else. All the married couples said amen. Because Lord Almighty, when I'm trying to deal with my wife, I'm like, Lord, work on her. Work on her. Work on her. She's in the back bedroom. Work on him. Work on him. And both of us, the God is just like, both of you need to let me work on you first before I work on the other person. Stop dealing with the other person. You need to deal with you. Ask God what, to identify what you need in this moment. Number two, second step of this, find at least one promise of God. You know what messes up intellectual people like myself? Is instead of finding one promise, we try to find 1,000 promises. I'm going to set you free from something that has just plagued me. It's plagued me in the past. I've had to stand on this word alone. All you need to change your life is one word from God. All you need is one promise. Sometimes all you got to stand on is the basic promises that kids learn in Sunday school. By his stripes, I am healed. He took up my infirmities. He bore my diseases. And by his stripes, I am healed. Sometimes you got to stand on the basic word. I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. I thank you, God, that my needs are met by your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You don't need 10,000 verses. You just need one word from God, one promise from God. And here's where you get them. You get them from the Bible. This is the secret. You get them from the Bible. This thing, I don't want to go into a history lesson, but the Bible didn't used to look like this, didn't feel like this. The Bible is comprised of 66 books throughout history that were written about God. 66 separate books. And the reason why they were put together is because early on in in the Christian days when, when the church was exploding with growth, there were people who would, you'd, you'd find one book of Leviticus. And you go read Leviticus and that's all you know about God, you're going to think God hates you. So they begin to take the, the real, uh, they call it the canonical, the canon of God. Everything that lines up perfectly. And when you go read this Bible, there's people who will try to deny it. But let me tell you something, the Bible matches up perfectly if you know how to study it the right way. And when you read this, what happens is you'll see there's a promise in the, in the Old Testament that is fulfilled in the New Testament. The bottom line is this. Every word from God will come to pass if you have faith to believe in the word of God. Ask God to identify what you need and then find at least one promise of God. Now, I'm going to give you permission here for a second. This is where Google helps. They didn't have Googles back in the 1800s. Didn't have Google when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we had to memorize scripture. You came to church as a kid, you're going to learn a new scripture every single week. You think I learned this in Bible school? No, I paid too much money for Bible school. I learned the word of God when I was a kid. When I was a baby, that's when they taught me all the word. Some of you, you didn't get that. That's okay. Can I tell you something? Start today. 
Just start today. Find one promise of God. Type it in Google. Scriptures about healing. It will pop up. And Google's smart enough to know when you say scriptures, you're not talking about other religions. You're talking about the Bible. That's what's amazing to me. Scriptures about financial prosperity. Scriptures about mental illness. Scriptures about, and there's something called Open Bible. That's probably one of the first links that'll show up. But find one promise. And here's your third step. This is the hardest thing. This is where people just mess it up. They miss it so consistently. It's not only do you ask God to identify what you need, not only do you find at least one promise of God, but you pray that promise until you have what you need. Should have got way more amens on that. You pray that promise until you get what you need. The reason why Christians miss it is because they stop praying short of the solution. They stop praying short of the miracle. They give up on that word and they go to another word. I want to go back to Romans 10, 17 for a second. He says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The word come in the Greek literally means this. It means to be separated from something else and attached to something new. So your faith, the faith in God comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What he's saying is this, when you start hearing the word of God, faith will become detached from that fear and it will be attached to the word of God. Faith will become detached from that abuse that was done to you and attached to the word of God. There are people who are having faith. They have unbelief in them. It's not because they don't have enough faith. It's because their faith is fractured. They have faith in their past rather than faith in the word of God. They have faith in Facebook posts rather than faith in the word of God. If you can get your faith in, in, in hearing your word of God over and over and over, praying it out loud, I thank you, God, in Jesus' name, by your stripes, I am healed. When you attach the name of Jesus to it, that means it's a legal document. Jesus signs the contract because his word said that you will cast out devils in my name. Anything you ask in my name, it will be given to you. So when you put the name of Jesus on the word of God, not on what you think it should say, but what it actually says, Jesus is in heaven. He says, Father, I signed the contract. It's done. That's what faith looks like. And you got it and you walk like a G like you know you got it. And you don't let nobody else tell you you don't got it. And you don't listen to other people. What we do, though, is we stop short of the signature of Jesus on the word of God. And we start listening to other things. Pray that word. Pray that promise. Just one word from God will change your life. Pray that promise until you have it. What if it doesn't happen in 30 days? Who cares? What if it doesn't happen when I really need it to? You don't know when you need it to happen. You don't know that. God could decide it needs to be two years from now. You don't know. God could decide it to be six months from now. You don't know. Because God is outside of time and space. One of the words that I go back to, every time I have a a struggle, because I'm an intellectual. I'm smart, (laughs) y'all. And when I learn something new, uh, scientifically, the thing that got me into neurobiology was the idea, or neuroscience was the idea of my nerves uh, hurting my system. And so I wanted to learn how the brain worked. And that's where I got into this idea of how the word of God affects our brains, not just our minds. Your mind is different from your brain. Right. Your mind is your spiritual mind. Your brain is different. But I, I started reading this and I always go back to this, Philippians 4, 6. Mm-hmm. Be anxious for Pandemics. No. Be anxious for your kids not healed yet. No, 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 no. Be a- no, no. What does it say? Be anxious for what's that word? Say it like you mean it. Nothing. 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 Nothing should cause you anxiety. Nothing should. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, that means literally to ask of God. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So here's what I like to tell people. Don't just pray the promise, but in faith, thank him for the promise. Don't just pray for the promise, but in faith, thank him that it's already done. Because faith doesn't make sense to the wise. It It doesn't make sense to me. I've been doing this for 35 years. It still doesn't make sense to me. But when I trust God and I begin to thank him, here's what I like to say. Pray that promise until thanking God for it is not weird. Because the first time you thank God 
for healing in your child's body when they diagnosed him with a lifelong illness, you're gonna look at that child, he's gonna start seizing on the floor. And guess what? You're gonna go, oh, why am I thanking God for this? There's gonna be situations that arise. They're gonna challenge your faith. You thank God for the promise until it's not weird anymore. You thank God for the promise until it shows up. You thank God until you know in your inner being that what you have prayed for, God has answered. You just keep on praying and thanking God until you can see the signature of the contract in heaven. Jesus signed his name and it is finished. That's what you thank God. You keep on thanking God until you know in your heart of hearts that it is done, it is finished, and Jesus gets the glory, not you. I am with the story. One of my favorite evangelists uh, over the last couple centuries was Smith Wigglesworth, which by the way, if you got a name like Wigglesworth, <laughs> you better find the right occupation. But he was a plumber by trade. He was a Scottish plumber. He received salvation. He put his faith in Jesus and became saved. And he really felt like God was calling him to preach the gospel. This is back in the early 1900s, by the way. So he would go to Salvation Armies and he would stand up and he'd open the Bible and he would have a panic attack, freak out. And he'd have to run off stage and his wife would come in and preach for him. Thank God for good women who stand behind us men when we don't know what we're doing. Amen. Some of you men can't receive that because you're too full of pride. Anyway, and so... One day, though, he got filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Everything changed. He said, when I stood up to speak, it's like I just already knew what to say. The Holy Spirit would just give him these words. He would preach powerful messages. And one of his big messages was, only believe. Only believe. I read that when I was a teenager. I'd read about his life and read his message. Only believe. Sounded stupid to me then. Sounds a little bit insane today. Only believe? Only believe? He was at a, <clears throat> uh, I guess, a, a church. I think this was the early 20s or early 30s. I could be wrong about my date. But anyway, so he gets up and he's preaching on healing. Only believe and miracles will happen. Have faith in God. That was his message. Have faith in God. Only believe. Don't look at the outward circumstances, but trust God in Jesus' name. He is performing his word. Same message I'm preaching today was preached 100 years ago. And it still lasts today. Right. So at the, end of these mes at the end of these messages, they would have testimony time. We don't do that anymore because y'all got strange. <laughs> but if you grew up in a, in a black church, you knew what testimony time was. That's why church lasted for eight hours because everybody had a testimony. And they would give somebody the mic and they start to, well, back in 1983, the devil was after me. I've been there. I've sat through these services. I'm like, what is happening, y'all? Can we get to lunch? Anyway, so they have these testimony services. This lady runs up on stage. I'll make this quick. She runs up on stage. Has this thick goiter on her neck. If you don't know what a goiter is, it means your um, thyroid, thank you. Your thyroid is inflamed. And they don't know exactly why it might happen. Back then, they didn't know why at all. They just called it a goiter. So big, giant goiter. She runs up on stage, she grabs the mic. She says, oh my God, Brother Smith, preach this word. And while I was sitting right over there, God healed me of my, that goiter. Healed me in Jesus' name. Runs off the stage. Okay. Didn't think anything about it. About a year later, he comes back. Another healing service. Have faith in God. Only believe. Don't look at the circumstances. Only believe. People get healed. People coming out of wheelchairs. Blind eyes open. Miraculous things. Supernatural power showing up in the midst of people's faith. Testimony time. People come up. My child was healed of you know, tuberculosis today and this person was crippled and they're walking now. Praise God, they're praising God. Well, here comes this lady. And her neck is even thicker than the last year. Runs up, grabs the mic. Brother Smith preached a word one year ago. This is what she said. One year ago, and I sat right over there, and I was healed instantly. My goiter was healed. Runs off the stage. Now, what do you do? If I'm Smith Wigglesworth, I'm like, God, that woman just ruined my ministry. <laughs> Why? Because her neck is thick. That's not usually what we want in a lady when we think thick, but that's what she had. She had a thick neck. So they just keep on with the service. 
So thick neck lady gets home, and she's a young lady. Her mom meets her in the living room, and she says, whatever her name is, I'll call her Sally. She says, Sally, you do understand something, right? You have a goiter on your neck. It's bigger than it was a year ago. You've been going around from person to person, anybody who will listen to you, telling them that a year ago, Smith Wigglesworth preached about faith in God and you got healed of a goiter. And I just, I'm sorry to tell you this, baby, but everybody thinks you're insane. You're crazy. If you go, and she said, no, I'm not. She said, listen, if you go up to your room right now, look in your vanity mirror, you will see how thick your neck is. So she went upstairs, didn't look in the mirror, but she got down on her knees in front of her bed and she said these words, and this has always impacted me. She said, God, I don't know what everybody else's problem is, but I know a year ago you healed me of a goiter. Now I pray that they would see what my faith already knows. It's recorded she woke up the next morning with the most beautiful neck you've ever seen. And that goiter was gone. Sometimes, when you're believing for things, your pastor gonna think you crazy. Because my faith isn't where your faith is at. Sometimes you're gonna trust God for something and your own family is gonna think you're crazy. Doctors are gonna think you're crazy. But when you know that you know that you know known and a no no that God's word is alive in you, that it is the only truth you need. Everybody else may not see it. The scans may not see it. The the, the, the specialist may not see it. The oncologist may not see it. But God knows and my spirit knows. And if my body knows, then it's going to get in line with what that word of God was. So I'm going to pray that promise. I'm going to thank God for that promise until other people can see it. Because while you can't see it, my spirit sees it. My spirit knows it. I'm already driving a BMW X5. You just ain't seen it yet. One day you're going to see me rolling up in it. I know my child's healed. Even though you don't see it yet, I know it. I see it in my spirit. That's what faith does. So you get a promise from God and you hold on to it like a dog on a bone and you thank God for that promise until it's not weird to thank him for it anymore. Until it's not unnatural to thank him for it anymore. That's all I got. Now, let me encourage you. Don't take this word alone and start practicing it without further instruction. So here's what I want to give you permission to do. Exactly what I said to do. If there is something that you feel like you need, go to God first and give him an invitation. Please let me know what I need, what I actually need. Then find a promise of God in the word of God in the Bible. Then start praying that promise, thanking God for that promise in faith. Next week, I'm going to build on this, and I'm going to answer this question again. Do I have enough faith? But we're going to look at it from a different perspective. Because while you can have faith, there's also an ingredient that you need for the God kind of faith that we didn't talk about today. So I want to build on this message for you, because I believe that God wants to do miracles through you in the new year.